recording. Okay. Okay. Very good. So I just had to reset who was which of my machines was the host here. So let's talk about Mass 261. Good morning. It's Delta College, multivariable calculus. This is Tuesday, November 23. This is our one and only class session this week because Delta College has Thanksgiving break on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. There's no courses on those days. There's no meetings or office hours scheduled. You can still contact me by email and I'll answer as I have time in the order I receive your questions. As soon as I have time, so I'll check my mail occasionally on the weekend. Today we have a special topic with kind of the gateway to the last ideas we're going to present in the course. It's called Green's Theorem. It's a very powerful theorem, and it comes in two flavors. And it's a theorem about two-dimensional plane, but it shows us the way to study what we really want to study, and that is fields in space. Now, there's not many things we want to study in the plane in general. By that, I mean, we really want to answer three-dimensional questions. So you might ask, how does a two-dimensional truth point the way to solving things in three dimensions? Well, we're gonna show you Green's theorem and how to use it in the plane, and then how to extend it to one dimension higher, to space. And this is not an uncommon trick in many fields or discussions like if you can understand something in the three-dimensional world maybe you can extend it to the fourth dimension maybe you can extend it higher to multiple dimensions in fact in mathematics there's a general truth although it's not my area of expertise the most difficult dimensions really are three four and five many things we can extend to multiple higher dimensions and we understand in multiple higher dimensions above five things can be proven sometimes more easily in the higher dimensions because literally there's more room to maneuver but dimensions four and five are sometimes a little bit tricky so there's a whole industry of different types of mathematics and theorems where people try to extend from one dimension to another. So this is a small example we're showing you by level of difficulty, but it's kind of interesting. So first I wanna make sure you characterize conservative fields correctly. And we will pull up the note from the book that does that. But then we're gonna show you what to do in the case in the plane where you don't have a conservative field. And that's called Green's theorem. Green's theorem comes in the circulation form. We'll call it curl form sometimes. And it comes in a flex form, what people sometimes call the divergence form. But we're going to explore these words curl and divergence more carefully in the next section. So 
I'm going to talk about circulation of flux mostly today. I'm going to be using that vocabulary mostly today. I want to switch back to section 6.3 for a second. So that I focus your mind on these theorems about conservative fields. And that's 610, 611, and possibly 69. 68, 69, 610, and 611. So let's put an asterisk here. And then tell you to review. I'll review them for you, but I'll just write these down in my notes so you can know where to find them. Six, eight, six, nine, six, ten, and six, eleven of section six point three. So if we get too busy and excited in mathematics, to mention this later, I do wish you a happy Thanksgiving and I want you to stoke up with lots of calories so you're ready to make the final push through our course. So I'm going to open our textbook and show you these theorems just to make sure you're totally solid on conservative fields because we need to know when conservative fields are present and when they're not, if we're going to properly use the ideas that we're going to present today. And when conservative fields are present, we want to know how to construct their potential functions. We don't want to spend time on their potential functions if no such potential function exists. So let's get the table of contents going here. Oh, table of contents is not going to help me. So let's see if I can quickly get to chapter six in here. Five. It's also a very nice project in the back of this section that we'll talk about today. Here we go. And I might say a word or two about it, but I'll let you investigate it on your own, explaining what a pl planimeter is. Okay, here's section six, three, and there's theorem six, seven, and here's theorem six, eight. Okay, so this is what I want you to start with, and then I'm going to show you some items on our website, and then we'll get going. So let me share this book with you right here. Conservative field is a very special field, and you want to know how to recognize it, but you need to recognize it correctly. So some of our theorems say, if this, then that, and some of our theorems say, this if and only if that. When you say something, if and only if something, you're characterizing it like I will give you $10 if and only if today is Tuesday. So you have to line up for your $10 bills outside my office today. You have to collect them in person actually. But when someone says if A then B, what they're doing is telling you a property of A. In the presence of A, you will observe B. If A happens, then B will happen. It's called a property of A. It's one of the things that's associated with A. But that doesn't mean that if you see B happen, then A has happened or A is present. You know, B could happen 
for other reasons. So that's how you read this first theorem, theorem 6.8. It says, if you have a conservative field, then the work done by the field is independent of paths. They stayed a little bit abbreviated here. Or a line integral over the field is independent of path. So if you have a conservative field, it has this beautiful application that you can move from one point to another point, and it doesn't matter which path you take. You could integrate over, in this picture, three different paths, and you'd find the same value of the line integral. So the line integral of f dot dr over c1 and f dot dr over c2, they are equal for any c1 and c2 you pick. This also says that if you ran over C2 in reverse, we mentioned this last time, that if you start at one place and stop at one same place in a conservative field, then you'll have no net circulation. You'll have no net work. You'll have a zero line integral over a simple closed curve. Now that doesn't mean anytime you see that, you're in the presence of a conservative field, but it's a promise that if you are in the presence of a conservative field, you will always see that. Okay, so get your logic and your implications in order. Let's try theorem 6.9. Theorem 6.9 says, could you work backwards? If you found you were in the presence of a field that was line integrals independent of path, could you conclude that you were in the presence of a conservative field. Well, this theorem says, if you add one more condition, if you're observing a continuous vector field that's independent of path, where the line integrals are independent of path, and the domain of this field is open and connected, and it doesn't say simply connected yet, that's a different matter, but open and connected, you can get from one place in the domain to another place in the domain on a path that is completely within that domain. Then you have a conservative field. You say, well, this is exciting. Now I have a way to prove a field is conservative. But the problem with this is, how do you prove that a vector field's line integrals are independent of path? Well, unfortunately, you'd have to check every single path possible between every single pair of points possible, even starting and stopping at the same point in a domain that's open and connected. Open and connected is not as hard to check, but checking that something is independent of path requires you to check every possible path. Well, there could be an uncountably large number of possible paths. And there is, and if, if the domain is an open connected set in the plane. So this is a curiosity. This is a nice way to think about conservative, but it's not a great way to show something as conservative. Let's move on to section six or theorem 610. We're in section 6.3, by the way, as we noted on our notes. I'm going to slide down quite a bit. Here we go. Now, here's another famous simple test for conservative fields. And you had this property of conservative fields back in section 6.1 that if a field was conservative, then this mixed partials, this crossed partial equations held. This is what we will call formally in the next section, having a zero curl. And you can do this in two dimensions and three dimensions. In two dimensions, the mixed partial property, the cross partial property is simply partial P partial Y equals partial Q partial X for a field with two components, P and Q. But you learn that a conservative field in two dimensions satisfies this first cross partial test and in three dimensions satisfies these three cross partial tests. If you're in the presence of a conservative field, you will always observe that. If you observe that, does not mean you're in the presence of a conservative field? The answer is no, not unless you have additional information. And what is the additional information in this case? 
if you observe this condition and the domain of the field is open and simply connected, not just connected. I got to be careful my words. I was about to say not simply connected, but simply connected. No, no. Simply connected, remember, was any closed loop that lies in the region can be contracted to a point and remain in the region throughout the process of the contraction. And the fancy, fancy way of saying your region in the plane has no holes in it. Or in space, there's no blocking to shrinking that rubber band in space to a single point. So if a vector field is on an open and simply connected set, region D, then this property of the cross partials is enough to force the field to conserve, to be conservative. Well, this is much easier to check than path independence, right? Because I only have to check three equations, not an infinite multitude of different paths between different points. So if F is a vector field, an open, simply connected set, then these things hold if and only if F is conservative. Theorem 611 takes the truth that we observed here in Theorem 610, and marries it to the truth from section 6.1 that if a field's conservative, it satisfies these qualities. And then this becomes what we call a characterization of conservative. If and only if is a very special phrase in mathematics. It means this completely describes that. I'm gonna give you $10 if and only if it is a Tuesday. That completely describes Tuesdays in your mind. That means if I gave you $10, you know for a fact it's Tuesday. And if it's Tuesday, you know for a fact that I'm going to give you $10. That's a way of completely describing Tuesdays. I am trying to draw a word picture in your mind. Well, that's not so much a word picture as it is a kind of a promise or a contract. That's what this phrase, if and only if, means. If and only if is like a contract, that this and this are the same. Okay, so the consequence for you is I want you to be very careful. If someone asks you if a field is conservative, you can't just check the cross partials and say cross partials are equal, it's conservative. No, you also have to demonstrate that you're living on an open and simply connected region. It's not hard to recognize but you have to look out for those cases where you might have a hole in the region, or you might have a singularity, such as a single point where the field is not defined. Okay, good. So that's where we are. Now I'm gonna go back to the paper, share something with you from the website. And let's move over to, I'll keep the book handy, but I wanna show you some handouts on my website. They're gonna be very useful to you as you think about this topic. So let's share website screen and navigate to our website, Math 261. Resources, week 13 is our holiday shortened week. This is well, some notes about Green's theorem right here. Let me enlarge this. And let me draw your attention to these several handouts. So under handouts, here's a handout that kind of summarizes what we've said about conservative fields in case you wanna organize that information in your mind. But here is a presentation and quite nearly approved, but a step-by-step -step demonstration of Green's theorem in curl form 
and divergence form. I want to see if there's anything. And then, by the way, don't forget, as you're preparing for our last exam, I've got some theorems that deal specifically with Green's theorem, Gauss's theorem, and Stokes' theorem. As I said, Green's theorem is a theorem about a truth in the plane, but we get to extend it to space. And these two extensions, Green's theorem comes in two forms, like the two sides of a coin. The curl form of Green's theorem, when we extend it to space, will be called Stokes' theorem. And the divergence form of Green's theorem, when we extend it to space, will be called Gauss's theorem. Sometimes people refer to the divergence theorem instead of Gauss's theorem, but let's not disrespect Gauss. Uh, he made some key insights here. So I'll consistently call it Gauss's theorem. And then this is some nice mathematic notebook we can use next time, flex through a cone to see some of these things happening. Uh, don't forget this exercise 6280 demonstration to help you with some of the graphics that we're doing. Now, this conservative field handout, I'm just showing you what was on the website, is a description of the key ways you recognize or demonstrate a conservative theorem. Notice in my description of a field here, I'm using little f and little g for the field components. And sometimes we're using little p, or capital P and capital Q. I want to make sure I draw your attention to this formula sheet. I'll do that in a second. So whether a book or a presenter uses different names for these field components, you have to make that adjustment. Here I was using phi for a potential function, and this book uses little f for a potential function, which I have some sympathy for. But here are some of the vocabulary words that talk about open region, connected region, simple closed curve, simple curve, closed curve, simply connected region, and conservative field potential function. So if you want a single handout that talks about all of these vocabulary words and summarizes what it means to be a conservative field, look at this handout. These two handouts that we'll talk about today, Green's theorem and curl form and divergence form, are not something that you need to reproduce, but there's a demonstration of why Green's theorem is true in the plane. And again, you'll have to bear with the fact that I used lowercase f and lowercase g to represent the component functions. So your book here would write p and q, and it would say partial q, partial x, and partial p, partial y. Some books call this quantity the curl of f with a lowercase c-u-r-l. Some books use the del cross f operator because they want to naturally extend things to three dimensions. So you have to get used to different notations. Some people use f dot dr instead of f dot tds. And this expression here, f dx plus g dy is a rewriting of f dot dr. f being lowercase f lowercase g and dr being dx dy. Okay, after that handout, Here's the other side of the coin of Green's theorem. It's called the divergence form. And this deals with f dot n ds. Now this book uses the capital N, but defines it to be n ds is the infinitesimal vector dy comma minus dx. And it says, if you want to investigate the outward flux, all you have to do is take the integral of the divergence over the region enclosed by the simple closed curve C. So I'll explain what these are, but I just want to make you aware of these two handouts. These two handouts that I just showed you are key handouts to help you understand what Green's theorem is. What follows underneath is kind of a technical looking calculation, which is not past you, 
but it's not something I would require you to do. I just require you to use Green's theorem correctly. But if you want a technical explanation for why Green's theorem is true, that's what this calculation is for in the bottom of the two sheets. Okay, let's go over to formula sheet four before we return to our paper. And on these formula sheet, I present the flow and the flux of a field across the curve in all three forms, f dot dr, f dot tds, and f dx plus g dy in the case of three dimensions plus h dz. Here's the flux, f dot dn or f dot nds. You could express it in multiple ways. And this in two dimensions is f dy minus g dx integral, line integral. So what does flux look like in three dimensions? That's farther down the page, which we'll talk about in section 6.6. Six. But we can talk about today circulation and flux in the plane. And here's our statements of Green's theorem in both the curl or circulation form and the divergence or flux form. The rest of this sheet talks about how we're going to extend Green's theorem space. And so this is not our concern today. So we're talking about this fourth theorem today. I just wanna make sure you saw where all this reference material was. Okay, I think we're about ready to go back to our paper. Very good. So let's think about a conservative field F of X, Y. Huh, somewhere I'm going to have to make to be consistent with the presentation of this book and to be matching some of the examples we're going to do when we pull problems out of the book. Somewhere I'm going to have to make this transition from saying F and G on my handouts to P and Q on the paper. So I guess this is the moment. I'm talking about a conservative field in the plane with component functions P of X and Y and Q of X and Y. And that means that we know for a fact that partial Q partial x minus partial p partial y is zero. We also know that any line integral over a curve c from a point P1 to P2 is independent of the path I take between the two points. I'll say that with this little drawing. And the third thing we know is related. Now it's time to introduce this symbol that if C is a simple closed curve, that I traverse the counterclockwise direction as an inside and an outside, then when I calculate the contribution of field to the curve over the entire curve, I must get zero. These three things are consequences of conservative field. Alone, they're not enough to demonstrate the field's conservative unless I'm in the presence, unless this field is defined over a simply connected, an open simply connected region. But the moment someone hands me a conservative field, I have these three things guaranteed. The question is now,
what happens if the field is not conservative? What do I do if I happen to know that the field that I'm looking at is not conservative? I just throw up my hands. I just say, well, I can't talk about this or this isn't worthwhile. I still might want to make some calculations in that field. I still might want to move from one place to another in that field, but then I got to be careful and that maybe possibly about the path I'm taking. Maybe that'll influence the amount of work done. So I've already given you this example of lifting an eraser off the ground in the presence of the gravitational field. And that is whether I lift the eraser straight up or whether I lift the eraser off the ground, wiggle it around, and then arrive at that place. The amount of work done by the gravity field on that eraser is the same. And the proof is if I release that eraser after I followed either the red or the green path, the, release, the eraser releases the same amount of potential energy when it strikes the ground. Raising it three feet stores the same amount of potential energy in the eraser, whether I raised it straight up or raised it on some wild and wiggly path. That doesn't mean I myself didn't perform a different amount of work on this. I might be more tired waving it around for 30 minutes before I raise it three feet. But the work done by the gravitational field in both cases is the same. Now here's an example where something is clearly not conservative. And I like that the book opened this chapter with this presentation. I don't know how much you guys are for watching the Olympics. It's kind of fun to watch all the different sports and to see people being excellent at different sports. But there's one sport that always fascinated me, and that was the whitewater kayaking. And you maybe have seen this on television. They have a very fast moving stream, and they have rocks throughout the stream, and then poles or gates which the competitors had to go through in different directions. Sometimes you went through a direction in the for or through a gate in the forward direction, and sometimes they had gates that you had to circle around and go through in the backwards direction. And your goal was to go through this race course, and, and the water here was flowing rapidly too many pens. I need a pen for water. What would be the natural color for water pen? And that would be blue, right? The field here was flowing rapidly and there were eddies in the field and currents and you had to fight the water as you come around here. And I, I'm not even drawing it well because I'm first of all, not an artist and second of all, not a hydraulic engineer. But I, I know it was all messed up and wiggling around like this. And I always dreamed that I would be the person that would get the gold medal in this competition. But between me and my gold medal, there was always what? There was always the East German superstar. And he or she was in this boat and they would just paddle in this boat and power their way through every gate. Of course, you got penalties if you missed a gate or went through a gate in the wrong direction, even if you just touched the poles, for goodness sakes. But the East Germans were particularly adept at this for some reason. I don't know why. I've never been to East Germany and seen these rivers, but they must have lots of rivers like this. They would just power through this gate and no ever touching a pole, always going in the right direction. And they would end up, you know, down here at the end of the course, you know, tired, exhausted. And with this time, this impossible time of, you know, 4.07 seconds with no fault. 
I, on the other hand, at first didn't understand this at all. I just said, my goodness, I could go through there much faster. I don't understand why that person is wiggling around. I'm just going to shoot straight down the field. I think I could easily do that course in about one and a half minutes at most. I deserve the gold medal. Well, of course, you realize that's ridiculous. But why is it ridiculous? Why should that person be awarded with a gold medal when they took much longer to complete this course? And, and your first reaction is naturally, well, obviously it was harder to do it that way. And I said, well, I should be rewarded for finding the easier way to go through the path, the easier way to go through the course. And if I prompted you, you would probably say something like, well, the German competitor did more work. And I said, that's ridiculous. We both started at the same place and we both stopped at the same place. How could he have done more work than I. And do you see what the problem was? This field, this field of flowing water is not conservative. And that's the reason why he gets the gold medal and I get bounced from the Olympic Village because this is not a conservative field. And even if we start and stop at the same place, he's gonna do considerably more work to complete that course. That's why he's rewarded. So I only show this to you to give you a physical feeling of what it means to be in not a conservative field and to tell you that I may want to study or do calculations about fields that are not conservative. I just can't throw them out and say, I'm not going to touch those. I'm not interested in those. So this is a serious question. What happens if the field is not conservative? Another way to say this is, what happens? And this is going to match what we're going to present in our handouts. What happens if there is some kind of, and here I'm being casual and not mathematical, some kind of leftover contribution? of F after I traverse or after I complete a simple closed circuit or a simple closed curve. Remember if a field is conservative, if I start and stop at the same place, then the net work done or the net of the effect a field, the net effect of the field for and against me turns out to be zero. That's like taking this eraser off the ground, waving it around for a while, and then returning it to the ground. No matter how much you waved it around, no matter how furiously you threw it around, if you return the eraser to the place where it began in the presence of a gravitational field, you have not changed its potential energy at all. You've done no work on the eraser. Or I'm more proper to say the gravitational field has done no work on the eraser. But what happens if you go from this point and you make your simple closed circuit, your simple closed curve, your simple closed loop, and you find that this integral is not zero, that there's some kind of leftover contribution of F. Is there a way to characterize that contribution 
is there a way to account for it and to calculate for a general simple closed curve what that contribution amounts to? And the answer is to both questions, what happens in this case? What happens if the field is conservative? Was discovered by the English physicist or described neatly by the English physicist Green. This is called Green's theorem. Green's theorem answers these questions. Now I'm going to state Green's theorem formally, and then I'm going to explain it to you. And I'm going to use the handouts that I showed you earlier. And I think I will state it formally on this piece of paper. So I've numbered my paper, and we're ready to move up. I had to spend some extended time today setting that scene, setting this scene. So I'm going to have Green's theorem in front of me, and and I'll take you back to the handout. Green's theorem, circulation form. Then we'll do some calculational examples so you can get a feel for it. it says this. The counterclockwise circulation It's good to hear this spoken, even though I've written it in my handout. Counterclockwise circulation of a field F of X comma Y. I'll state this in the PQ form, even though my handout states it in the FG form, I'll state it in the PQ form that the book uses. Oops. P of X, Y, Q of X, Y, this means you're gonna to have to be flexible. Let me go back to our handout in a second. Around a simple closed curve. C is equal to the double integral of the curl of F over the region R enclosed by simple closed curve C. This is talking about so many physical things. It's talking about a field, it's talking about a curve, it's talking about a region that it must be drawn. It simply must be drawn. In integral language, it says counterclockwise circulation. We're gonna pull out our counterclockwise circulation integral of the field along a simple closed curve C. Now, some people, when they write the circle integral like this, they say, you don't have to add the arrow. I like to add the arrow just to remind myself I'm always going counterclockwise. If you don't see that arrow there, then you're assumed unless you're told otherwise that the circulation is counterclockwise. The counterclockwise circulation of a field around a simple closed curve is equal to the double integral over the region R enclosed by the simple closed curve, the double integral of what? Well, double integral refers to area, the curl of F. And the curl of F is this quantity, partial Q partial X minus partial P partial Y. So this is called Green's theorem circulation form. 
This is written symbolically. Let's draw a picture to represent it. And then we're gonna to go to our handout. It says, if you have a simple closed curve C, starting and stopping at the same place, we can call T equals A, T equals B right here, but I'm not going to clutter this with unnecessary letters right now. And you traverse this in the counterclockwise direction, then adding up the contribution of the field in the direction of motion over the whole curve is the same as adding up the contribution of this quantity, which we'll call curl, to the region R enclosed by the simple closed curve. And that is very, very strange. I'm gonna take the last few minutes before I go to a break, going through this exactly according to the handout because this is very strange. Why should walking around a pool measurement be equal to the measurement of a quantity to the pool itself. This leads to very startling results. If you reduce it, for example, to length and area, why should the length of this curve be related to the area of this region? In fact, do you know that I could tell you the area of this region? just by using the length of this curve. This is the handout or the project in the back of this section called a planimeter. I, I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that well, a planimeter. Have you ever seen the tool that a surveyor uses, kind of a wheel on the end of a stick? Now you could use that to measure distance, but there's a fancier tool that you could take and simply walk the wheel around the outside of a pond and you could read off that tool the area of the pond. And that seems really, really strange or counterintuitive. Well, we'll address that later, but first let's talk about the plausibility of this fancy, fancy language right here. Let's go back to our handout and talk about this for a few minutes before we take a break. Okay. And I'm trying to see if I can make this a little larger and more readable for you. Hang on. Okay, there's our expression of Green's theorem curl form. And here's a drawing on the left, similar to the one I've just made. And I only apologize that you observe that I'm using the field components of little f and little g. So in your mind, you're gonna have to translate them sometime to p and q. Right now, why don't you just go with the little f and little g. So let's look at both sides of this integral and see why this could be true. Let's think about traveling around the outside of the region, that's the C. And let's think about integrating this unusual quantity over the whole area of the region. So let's focus on the area of the region with this little da element in my picture. Now let's put this da element, this little area element at the position x naught y naught in its lower left hand corner. That's where we're gonna nail it down. And I want you to take this d element, da element and enlarge it. So over here on the right, I have a super large version of the da element. I think I might make some drawings on this later. So let me get out my annotation tools, okay? Now, you know, that's the problem with the drawing tools is I have to also move this paper up and down. Let's walk around the outside of this DA element. Tiny, tiny area square, tiny, tiny floor tile inside my round room or inside my pool. 
But the advantage of walking around this floor tile is it's a very simple thing to describe. As I take a walk from one corner to the other, I'm either walking entirely horizontally or entirely vertically. So let's focus on walking around this floor tile. Where I start is entirely arbitrary, but I've labeled the sides of the floor tile one, two, three, four from the first vertical movement upwards, then horizontally to the left, then vertically down, then horizontally to the right. As long as I get back to where I started from, I'm perfectly okay. Well, the first step I will take F dot T. But let's look at F dot T. Let's look at the contribution of field to this path. My unit vector, my TDS is entirely upwards. It's entirely in the J direction. And the distance I cover, the DS is entirely due to the change in Y. So the tiny change in Y. So I can call the contribution of the field to that path F dot TDS, I'll write it as F dot J D Y, F dot J delta Y. And that's equal to what? It's equal to the change in the function, the f dot j, well, f is composed of little f and little g, but when you dot it with j, I only get the contribution from g. And I'll take my measurement of g from this lower corner, this lower right-hand corner. This thing is so small, it doesn't necessarily matter where I measure the volumes from. I'll take the reading of g from the lower left-hand corner, which is g of x naught plus delta x comma y naught times delta y. So this on the left is the contribution to field. This is an approximation of that contribution just by executing that dot product. And now I'll do the same thing for all four paths. And this takes a quite a bit of reflection. I mean, you don't expect that you're going to answer this or understand it instantly, but you reflect on these four paths. When I walk along path two, I'm walking in the negative horizontal direction. So the contribution there is F dot minus I change in X. And that amounts to the change in the value of F or just the value of F on a selected sample point in this region here. So this is minus F. I choose the upper left corner x naught comma y naught plus delta y times delta x. And you'll see why I choose these points as I do in a moment. And let's complete our walk around square by going on path three, which is going in the negative j direction. And again, takes a reading from g after you do the dot product. And then let's finish our path by walking in the positive horizontal direction on path four. And I'll take my reading from the lower corner, left corner, the X naught, Y naught. So I have now walked around this entire square. And what is the sum of the contributions? Well, in a conservative field, the sum of the contributions would be zero, but I don't want to assume on them in a conservative field. So let me physically add these contributions together. I think the picture is going to slip off the screen. Well, we'll keep the picture here for a second while we're discussing. If I add these contributions together and slip in a little delta x, delta y action, numerator and denominator, that doesn't change anything. But look at how I organize them. I organize them by the delta y and the delta x common factor. So here's g of x naught plus delta x comma y naught minus g of x naught y naught. Here's f of x naught comma y naught plus delta y minus f of x naught y naught. And when you group those two together and factor out the delta x and delta y, they look suspiciously familiar. If you insert the delta x, delta y, numerator and denominator, 
and then cancel the common factor of delta y in the first group and delta x in the second group, do you see what you have left? You have a difference quotient for the function g with the change happening in the first slot. That would be the rate of change of g with respect to x. And then you look at the f portion, you have the rate of change of f with respect to y. And that's known as the curl of the field. As delta x and delta y go to zero, these become equal to the partial derivatives. Say, so, well, now you're showing me something that looks like this formula. Absolutely. But now you say, now here's the part where we have to get together on this. You say you only walked around one little square. But I'll say, and now it's time to go back to my paper before we get ready for our break. I'll say as I walk counterclockwise around the square, and likewise for all the squares that are adjacent, let's do a super zoom on this complex. As I walk counterclockwise along each square, do you see what happens on the adjacent square? Walking counterclockwise simply traverses this path in the opposite direction. And on the next square that's adjacent to it, counterclockwise traverses this square in the opposite direction. And do you see every time two squares adjoin, I am taking the line integral in one direction then immediately taking the line integral in the other direction. So what does that do? Well, regardless of the value, when you take the line integral in the reverse direction, you simply come up with the opposite numerical result. So on the inside of this region, on all the little area pieces that I calculate on, I am left with no contribution on all the grid lines. And as I push the little squares out to the end, what are the only contributions that are never canceled out? In a funny way, you can say it's the contributions that come from the outside edges that are never canceled out. And what do those contributions add up to? Those contributions add up to the counterclockwise circulation along this curve. Now, what I've given you is not a mathematical proof. It's a mathematical argument of plausibility. So if you were to continue on in mathematics, do some more courses, do some advanced calculus where you actually prove a lot of your calculus theorems, then you would prove this result formally. But I've given you a strong reason to believe why it's true. So before I take a break, I want to say one thing. You're going to say, well, why would I ever want to do a double integral to accomplish the work of a single integral? Aren't double integrals naturally harder? Well, that depends on this quantity. If this quantity is zero, this double integral is very easy. And that's why in a conservative field, the circulation is zero. What if this quantity was a constant? Then this double integral would simply be the area of the region, which you might have by geometric means. I could just tell you the circulation by telling you the contribution of a constant to the area of a region. That would save me a heck of a lot of work in the parameterization of a circle or some other strange curve. Now it could be the other way around. It could be that this double integral is a monster to compute, but the circulation integral by some physical properties might be easy to compute. So Green's theorem is not one shortcut. Green's theorem is two shortcuts on two sides of the coin. If this integral is simple to compute, it'll save you the time for doing this. But sometimes this integral is simple to compute and it saves you the trouble of doing this. You have to be open-minded 
that you could have a time saver in either one. Now, what we have to do here is we have to actually do this with an example so you can see it in action. But this was the buildup and the theoretical discussion of Green's theorem. Now, what we need here, because you guys have worked too hard, is a serious break. So let's come back at 9.10, and we'll do an actual physical example. And after that, we'll talk about the other form, which operates on the same principles. And once you've accepted this and practiced this, the Green's theorem curl form is not more intimidating. OK, you take a break. You stretch your legs. I'm going to do likewise, and we'll come back in several minutes.
Okay, excuse me, I was delayed there for a second. Got it. Okay, so let's do a practical example of this. Before we do that, let's just remind you that people can express these integrals in multiple different ways. We could express this integral as f dot dr in the work format or f dot tds or in the component format edx plus qdy and then the problem is pdx and qdy seems to be scrambled over here on the right hand side so you got to be very careful with the multiple formats here. And over here, even sometimes people express this as its English description, the curl of the field. Some people don't like to use curl in this two dimensional context in this way. So they use the word curl F like this. And in the three dimensional context, we often use the curl del cross F. But I'm going to have to save these writings for when we formally discuss curl in the next section. But the reason why there are so many different ways of writing this is because this truth has been applied in so many different fields. And this idea has been expressed in so many different ways, principally in physics, that people had different habits of writing these integrals and these quantities. So you need to be flexible. You need to be, look at, when you're looking at any description of a problem or physical situation, you have to fit the description you're given to the truth. You have to be able to read someone else's expression of the truth, as long as what they're expressing is true. Let's do an example. And we'll pick one out here, all from section 6.4. Let's pick out something ordinary. And show you where Green's theorem might be a little bit of a time saver. Let's look at 159. This is just a very simple first example. In section 6.4. He has a graphic in the book. I'll share that graphic in the book with you, but I think we might write our own graphic in a second. So this is 6.4159. We were thumbing through 6.3 in a second. Now here's section 6.4. I don't want to refer to a page number because depending on what form of this book you're looking at, you might be looking at a different page number, but I'll show you the picture. This is what we described later. It was a planimeter, the idea that you could measure the area of something just by measuring its boundaries length. And so they walk you through a technical discussion. Maybe I could tell you something about that later, but not immediately. Okay, let's look at, zoom, 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 zoom. I'm looking at 159, that's right here. Okay, I'm not excited by his graphics. Maybe we could see if we could do better graphics in a second, but Here's what we want to do. Evaluate the line integral, x squared plus y squared dx plus 2xy dy. So already written in the different notation, written in the fdx plus gdy or pdx plus qdy form, where c is the curve that follows the parabola y equals x squared from 0, 0 to 2, 4, and then the line from 2, 4 to 2, 0. And then finally, the line from 2, 0 to 0, 0. Now, this is really not awesome here. 
because they've shaded they've shaded this little parabola slice but if you're paying attention they're referring to this region this almost triangular region in the lower right hand corner and this integral is a circulation integral we're in the presence of some field. They've made a raw drawing of the field here, not an excellent drawing. And some of our graphics have been better than this, particularly in the most recent version of Mathematica. So as you walk along this field, as you walk along this path in this field, is the net effect of this field for you or against you? We might open up Mathematica in a second, but now I'm going to redraw this. Oh, I apologize. I was not necessarily sharing that screen. So I just wanted to show you that here's the problem. And their drawing is a little bit awkward because they're referring to the lower right-hand region. But they've shaded this region, this little almond, this little slice of the parabola above the parabola. OK, so let me draw this figure neatly and then do the calculation. So we have this figure right here. I'll come back to my paper in just a moment, but I'll let you consume this out of the book. I am not going to draw this to scale, but I'm going to draw this in a different manner right here. Let's say that this is unit one. Let's say this is unit two. And the y-axis, the unit two and the unit four. And I'll take this to be my parabola. In other words, I'm drawing it accurately, but I'm not using the same scale on the horizontal and vertical axis. And I'm going to go straight down to the point zero zero. And I'm going to go back to the origin. And here's something else I don't enjoy about this problem, and you're still reading the problem on here. It says follows the parabola from zero, zero to two, four. Now what is up with that? And then goes down and then goes over. The authors are deliberately going clockwise and Green's theorem refers to counterclockwise. Well, how are we gonna account for that? Well, actually we're gonna have to take the opposite value of our double integral. But what's happening is we want to know the contribution of the field as I drive along this path like this. Maybe the field's for me, maybe the field's against me. I don't even wanna to try to draw the field arrows because you see on his figure how the field arrows didn't come out well or didn't come out completely visible near the origin. That's because they're smaller in magnitude. And here's my region enclosed. And now I'm going to shift back to my paper. And I want the counterclockwise circulation of f dot t ds to be calculated for the double integral of the curl of the field. over the region R with respect to area. What's my first problem? They didn't tell me what the field was, right? They gave me this simple integral to construct. Well, in fact, they didn't even give it to me counterclockwise. I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to say clockwise like that. I don't know. 
I mean, legally I am, but they gave me these two components of the field. So they never named the field, but remember this is the P component and this two X, Y is the Q component. So the field here, the P of X, Y, Q of X, Y, that's the first thing I have to do is learn to read this, must be X squared plus Y squared and the two X, Y. Okay, now I'm rolling because I can compute partial Q, partial X and partial P, partial Y. Next, instead of the curve C, which I again emphasize according to their description has traveled in a clockwise motion, I need to describe the region R. Well, this region R is not hard to describe in terms of integrating with respect to X and Y, because for every X, I can pick a single shot along the Y axis. So actually, this construction is going to be easier to execute. Why is that the case? Because to do this full trip around the boundary to fully express C, I'm gonna to have to break it into three pieces. I'm gonna to have to write three parameterizations and do three flow integrals, do three path integrals. It's doable, but it's a lot of multiplied work. It's a lot of repeated work. Sometimes the repeated work is better than this, but I think this is gonna be much easier. So let's express partial Q, partial X minus partial P, partial Y. And then let's set the limits of this region with respect to the variables X and Y. Partial Q, partial X is 2X. Excuse me, I got to look at the right thing. And this is why you say I get your variables mixed up right here. Partial Q, partial X is 2Y. Partial P, partial Y is 2Y. And now I've walked into a trap. Well, it's not a trap, it's kind of a pleasant accident kind of trap. This is not only easier, it's super duper easier because I've discovered that the curl of this field is what? 2y partial q partial x minus 2 y partial p partial y curl this field is zero now i want to express this in a particular way to draw your attention to something i could say i'm integrating zero over this region and i don't care what the region is the contribution of zero to each region element will always produce zero or i could look at it like this I could look at this zero as a constant that I factor out of the integral and I'm left with one dA. I could read this as zero times the area of A. Now, frankly, that's still zero. So I'm going to not bother to calculate the area of A, although I know even from my first calculus days, I could tell you the area of that expression right there. That'd be uh, one third X cubed from two to zero. Is that area eight thirds? I'll let you fill that in. But it doesn't matter what the area of R is. Zero times the area of R is zero. Now let's think about that. That was a major time saver. Otherwise, you would have had to split C into three pieces and execute the line integral on all three pieces. 
But still, I feel cheated. I really do feel cheated. It's my problem that I selected a non-exciting exercise, right? Because <coughs> our discussion was, why don't we figure out if we can do anything when the curl is not zero? So I don't think having the curl zero here is a really great example. Let's go and pick another exercise where the curl is not zero. So I'm gonna to have to pre-read the exercise just to be careful here. Let's do this. Uh, partial Q partial X is such partial P partial Y is such. Let's look at exercise 176. Okay, first exercise, not very exciting. Get ready to move the paper up. Let me slide back to the book and read this. This doesn't have a picture. We'll have to draw our own picture, but at least you can read the expression first. So I'm gonna blow that up and hopefully blow it up so it's readable. And since it's written in there kind of densely, let's Focus your attention. Evaluate the line integral, 2x cubed minus y cubed dx plus x cubed plus y cubed dy, where c is the unit circle oriented in the counterclockwise fashion. I'm gonna draw a sketch on my paper before I come back to my paper. And I think we're gonna to have to do some graphics with this. We could execute graphics on the previous problem and you're welcome to do that using the 6280 notebook that I've posted. But since the result turned out to be zero, I'm not sure immediately how exciting that's gonna be. I mean, it'll certainly show something. Remember that's net effect of zero, right? So, but I wanna shoot for a non-zero result here. So let's say this is a unit circle. I'll focus back on the paper in a moment. And I'm traveling in the counterclockwise direction. That's what I like. And I want to evaluate this 2x cubed minus y cubed x plus x cubed plus y cubed ey. Remember, this is describing a field to me with components P and Q. And that field is 2x cubed minus y cubed and x cubed plus y cubed. So this integral is f dot t ds or f dot dr, if you want to express it that way. Now, unit circles are pretty easy to describe. So now I'm gonna go back to our paper. I could describe this unit circle as parameterized by a simple cos t sine t from zero to two pi. Yeah, and that even goes in the counterclockwise direction. But I do not enjoy substituting this x and y into this because I'm gonna be creating Oh, cosine cubes, sine cubes, dx is going to be another sine. You know, I'm going to be creating powers of sines and cosines, which we can execute. But we wonder if there may be a simpler way. So let's check out the curl of f over the region 
enclosed by the circle. The region enclosed by the circle is this disk. Very easy to describe in polar coordinates, very easy to integrate over. So let's calculate the curl of F, partial Q, partial X, minus partial P, partial Y. And partial Q, partial X is 3X squared. And partial P, partial Y is 3Y squared, negative. When I subtract them, that negative becomes a positive and I get 3X squared plus 3Y squared. Thankfully, this time I get a non-zero example, but I get a bonus nonetheless. This is three times X squared plus Y squared. This will be very friendly in polar coordinates. Now I'm really encouraged. So I'm gonna pop over to the next page. I'll keep this on the paper for just a second. And now I know that I could calculate the circulation of this field. I'll keep the expression in the form they gave it to me, which would be probably kind of a chore if I physically parameterized it. I can instead, for the double integral over the region, of the curl of F with respect to the area. And I have computed the curl of F to be three X squared plus three Y squared. And I've expressed the region as a unit circle. So I'm immediately gonna take this, remember how much we enjoyed coordinate transformations. By the way, I like the work you did on the coordinate transformation on the exam because that showed you know, multiple coordinate translations, translation, constriction, or scaling, if you like, and then polar on top of that. That really showed you the power of coordinate transformations. Here, by comparison, it's gonna be simple. I'm just gonna go polar on this. I'm gonna go all polar on this puppy. And I'm going to integrate over a region from zero to one R, the data from zero to two pi, it doesn't necessarily matter how I describe that. I'm, and I'm not gonna show you the full coordinate transformation. I'm just gonna say, let's go polar. So three X squared plus Y squared gonna be three times R squared. And then if I go polar, remember dx dy will be replaced by r dr d theta. And the r dr d theta, the theta is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. And the r is going to go from 0 to 1. So now we're just going to crunch this integral 0 to 2 pi, 0 to 1. You say uh, 3 r cubed dr d theta. He said, I gotta, I gotta do a double integral. Oh no. Well, I promise you this double integral is gonna be easier than plugging in these sines and cosines and dealing with the powers of sines and cosines. Well, there might be shortcuts there too. But let's just execute this quickly. So this is three fourths r to the fourth, but because that's evaluated between zero and one, this is just total of three fourths. And then we integrate that from zero to two pi. So we get three fourths times two pi. And so now we get, you can cancel it two if you like six fourths or three halves pi. And that is the circulation of this field along that curve. It's a positive circulation. So it seems like the wind is most often at my back, or the field is most often assisting me along that curve, or more field is flowing along that curve than against that curve. Excuse me, I didn't move my paper up. Let's see if we can take this to Mathematica and draw this. 
So what I'm going to do is going to go get that notebook that I put on the website, the 6281, but let's modify it. So first I'm going to find it and open it, and then I'll share it with you. I'm going to open up a copy. 6280, 63135. I think I'm going to go with the 6280 demo. Uh, just to make sure I'm on the right page. What did we call this right here? 6280 demo. Let's go. And we opened it. That's good. I think I want to make sure I got a clean slate of Mathematica. So let me quit Mathematica and reopen it. Sorry. And then I'll share this with you. Got it. So it's open. Share screen. Mathematica notebook. Okay, let's get it over here. Let's potentially resize it. Not too much. Okay, that's good. So we use this, I'll just re-execute this notebook to show you a curve in the plane, a line integral, and then to show you a field contributing to a path. I think I can alter the second one now. Let's just alter this. Let's not get fancy. Let's just alter this because uh, I can fill in the rest of the circle and I could just change the field and let's see how this looks. So remember, R of T was described above as the circle. So let us just run that circle from 2pi instead. Oh, excuse me, 2pi like that. The field is not the gradient field that I have above, but the field is going to be this time the 2x raised to the 3 minus y raised to the 3, comma, x raised to the 3 plus y raised to the 3. Got it. Now I think my window's here to do the full circle. Let's go minus 1.5 to 5 in both directions. So that would get the full circle going. And so I have to make some other modifications. Did I type in the field correctly? Stuff, stuff, stuff. I think we got to do the circle two pi. Got it. But I think these three plot structures are going to be enough. Here's the parametric plot of the full circle. Here's the new vector field over a large square containing that circle. Here's highlighting the field along the curve. That's what I want to really, really look at. And then I've got putting them together with a nice plot legends. Let's just see what happens. Okay, here's my picture. And this doesn't come across badly, but let me see if I can enlarge it for you somewhat. So as I travel around the circle, sometimes the field is fighting against me. And sometimes the field is traveling with me. And interesting is that these yellow arrows at the first are maybe slightly at my back, but quickly they actually turned to slightly in my face for quite a while. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. These colored arrows are not matching this field at all. So I get upset about that. What did I have to go back? I didn't change the field here. Okay, so if you modify our sheets, you got to be careful what you modify, right? You've already probably observed that. Okay, back on top of it. Let's try this again. Okay, now this is a little more believable that I have what? A net of the effect of the field flowing with me. In fact, as it appears, 
I don't think any field arrow is ever in my face. So net effect here seems to have a hard idea. Like, hmm, is the net effect equal to the effect total? I think this is the effect total. But we're going to stick with net effect because sometimes in some fields, things would be blowing in my face. Do you see there seems to be a type of a rotation to this field? Maybe this is what a field that's not conservative looks like. A field that has what? Some type of rotational dynamics that's affecting our calculation. This is a simple example of rotational dynamics, but it's legitimate nonetheless. I'm going to do one more quick calculation before we're going. So this is so if I told you the net effect was along the counterclockwise curve, then you wouldn't have any problem believing me. But I can quantify that net effect by saying it's equal to three pi over two. The quantity of that circulation is a little bit over four and a half, the net effect. Sometimes the arrows are going strongly with me. Sometimes the arrows are just going barely with me. But all these arrows going outwards, that lends itself to another question. Isn't the field spilling out of this circle? So remember the amount of the field that goes with me on my path is called circulation. But there's also another component to each field arrow, and that is the component that's going directly outward from the path. And that's called the flux. Can I calculate? Likewise, I'll go back to my paper and I'll come back to this drawing. Can I likewise efficiently calculate the portion of the field that's leaving that simple closed curve? outward, leaving <coughs> a simple closed curve. So we have time for one more illustration. This is called Green's Theorem Flex Form. And then the other handout tells you exactly how I do that flux, how the amount of the field that spills out of one little area, area element spills into the, into the next area element, how things add up and cancel out until you get to the boundary where the field ultimately spills outside of the region. But the short version is, if you want to calculate the flux, of a field across the simple closed curve. You could parameterize the curve and insert it into the flux integral. Or you can simply calculate the contribution of the divergence to the region enclosed by the simple closed curve. And the divergence of F is referred to as partial P partial X plus partial Q partial Y as the twisting and rearranging of the partials. But in our current example, and they did not ask us to calculate this, I'm just adding this, in this current exercise of 176, I can do this very simply by calculating partial P partial X, excuse me, plus partial Q partial Y 
Let me get my field back on screen. What's partial P partial X? Here's my P. Remember, here's my P. Partial P partial X is six X squared. What's partial Q partial Y? Partial Q partial Y is three Y squared. And now I'm going to evaluate that over the area of this solid circular disk. So I'll move on to another paper and let's evaluate that quickly just for fun. Our drawing already tells us that the net amount of the field, we'll go back to our drawing very quickly. It's clear that field is leaving this region but I want to quantify, not qualify. The quality of this picture says the field is leaving the region. I want to quantify. I want to assign a number to how much field is leaving the region. So the flux, the field leaving the region is double integral over R dA of six X squared plus three Y squared. Make sure you calculate that correctly, dA. And now we're gonna to have to go polar on this. So uh, it's not as convenient as I might please, right? This is really three X squared plus three X squared plus three Y squared. Now this is three R squared, but I have this three X squared left over. Actually, it's not going to be so bad as you imagine. So in the polar integral, 0 to 2 pi and 0 to 1, I'll go directly to the polar integral. I have a 3r squared. Remember, I have r dr d theta. But I also have to represent 3x squared right here. 3x squared plus 3r squared. Now, x is r cos theta. You might think that this damages this 3r squared cos squared theta, but I don't think this is going to be so hard to execute. Let me rewrite this slightly so you can focus on it. Three r cubed, when I distribute that r, here's cosine squared theta plus one, if you factor out the three r squared, dr d theta. And first I just have to work on the r integral, which I already decided was three fourths. Remember you integrate this as three fourths r fourth, zero to one, just evaluates the three fourths. So now I've come to this integral. And see, this is illustrating to you, most people say, my gosh, a double integral has got to be worse than a single integral. Well, go and insert that path into that curve. Go and insert that curve into this flux and see how hard it is to evaluate. May not be impossible, but I have a feeling this is definitely faster. Now I got one plus cosine squared theta d theta. Now I want to draw your attention to this. Remember, trig identities are your friend. So cosine squared trig identity is one half plus one half cosine two theta, right? And that comes from manipulating the cosine squared of theta, uh, two theta, cosine squared of two theta is what? two times the cosine of theta minus one, two times cosine. Okay, I'm getting my trig identities mixed up. This is better. Cosine of two theta is two cosine squared theta minus one. Okay, so not always on the tip of my tongue, but I remember what? I remember the pattern, half plus half cos two theta. If you rearrange this, solve it for cosine squared theta, you add one, you divide by two, half plus half cosine two theta. But 
that works out to be what? Integral zero to two pi of three halves plus one half cosine two theta. And cosine two theta is two waves over to zero to two pi. So the net result of this contribution is going to be zero. This is not equal to zero, but two waves of a cosine, one, two, over zero to two pi as a net area of zero. That just means once I multiply right here, I'm sliding down the page too fast, I'm sorry. I'll just get three halves times two pi, which is three pi. So I have quantified how much field is leaving that circle, three pi. If this was gallons of water, if this was a quantity of heat, then I'd have a way of measuring this quantity versus another example and how much heat is being lost or water is being lost in that sense. Okay. I think we've come pretty much up to the end here. And I have given you examples of Green's theorem, both circulation and flux form. But the examples I've given you here are, oh, straightforward, that's nice. But I think you're gonna have to go seek out some other examples and draw some graphics for yourself. Because sometimes it might be more natural to say, I might have a field that's not exclusively going outwards. I might have a field that's not exclusively going counterclockwise. So examine the problems you're looking at and see if you can create similar graphics and then recognize the net circulation counterclockwise or the net flow outwards and see how that matches your calculation. Calculate both sides of Green's theorem to make sure that they match and are equal. And to give you some familiarity and some practice with that, that's exactly what I asked you to do in some of the homework problems over the next several sessions to calculate both sides to make sure you see that they're exactly the same before you depend on them and use them in practice. Okay, I have to cut it off here and go to some other office hours. Uh, I'm going to get this uploaded. And I think we've done all the recording correctly today, which probably appreciate since the visuals were helpful. But I will let you pop into office hours or send me questions as you will, so I can get these things processed and uploaded for everyone. If I do not hear from you between now and Thursday, I want you to have a very blessed Thanksgiving with your family, friends, however you get to spend it. Make sure you get some rest. And then we'll get into our final push of the semester. Best wishes.